So my last message, I don't think it was in a sermon. I think I was, it was one of the Sundays when we didn't have sermons at the church, but I was just talking about what I planned to do on my sabbatical. And one of the things that I said was I wanted to listen deeply. And, uh, and so I tried to listen deeply while I was gone. And I tried to think about what it's like having a ministry here at Ladera Community Church. And I guess I would say that I had some surprising thoughts, sort of some surprising revelations about what Ladera Community Church is and what my ministry is here. When I came here, I remember thinking upon hearing all the things that the church was doing, the things that were important to the church members and the activities that were being, uh, everybody was participating in or, or doing something with, I felt like how nice it is that this church has such a strong sense of identity and how nice it is that the seeking, serving, growing, quote, kind of captured the feeling of a strong, diverse in thought, not necessarily diverse in other ways, a strong, diverse, but united congregation. And we went through a vision process at the beginning, or well, a few months after I was here, and there was a strong sense that maybe we didn't need to do a vision process because we'd done one not that long before, but our memory was a little off because it had been six years before <laughs> that we'd actually done that. And now it's been uh, three and a half years or almost four years since uh, the last one. And a lot of the same language came through that sort of echoed prior language about mission and purpose and uh, things that we wanted to do. And uh, then there was a pandemic. I want you to know that I see all of that differently now. I don't see us as a united church. I don't see us as a church that knows who it is. And I don't see us as a church that knows what its purpose is. Now, we have lots of things that we come here for. There's lots of things that we get out of being here. There's lots of things that we sort of share a common sense of. We share a common sense of social justice. We share a common sense of, of being... Uh, informed. We share a common sense of, you know, sort of a lot of intellectual ideas about how to change the world and what it means for us to be active politically. But I think that that's something that's a little bit different from being united in purpose. Now, in some ways, what I just said sounds harsh, but I don't want you to feel bad about it. I want you to feel good about who you are. And I want you to feel good about who you are because one of those crazy things about life is that everybody always says, oh, you, just, you must know yourself. And they don't take into account that we are a changing human being continuously from the moment of our birth all the way through our life until our death. We're never a single being that has this single identity that can just be pinned down. We're never that. We're always changing. We have these many different parts of ourselves. So, so to know who you are is not just being able to make a statement about who you are, but it's also a part of a process where you have to be continuously engaging yourself and checking yourself and measuring yourself and evaluating who you are and why you do the things you do. Now, maybe I do that more than some people. I don't know. I don't think I'm the same person I was four years ago. I don't think I'm the same person I was 20 years ago and on back down through time.
It might be convenient to think that we've changed or that things are very different because of the pandemic, but I don't think that's the case. I think the pandemic did change the world that we're in, but I think the things that I'm talking about existed before I came here. And again, that's not a bad thing about anybody or anything that existed before I got here. It's just trying to understand the truth of who we are and knowing where we are in our journey. So what does that mean? Well, what that means is that I think that the pandemic kind of exposed things. It didn't change us. It just kind of showed us some of the things that may have, may have been so far under the surface, they may, we may have kind of felt the rumbling of those things, but we didn't really know what they were. But because of the pandemic, now we have a sense of, okay, life is a little more fragile. The world does change more rapidly than we sometimes think. There are a lot of things that have changed. And I'm going to suggest that there's one thing that's changed that we might really want to take a really hard look at. And I think that that change is in the definition of what social justice is. I think that there's a huge change in what it means to be just in the world. I think it's a huge thing for us to consider, especially because that idea of being aware in a social justice manner is so closely linked to who we believe we are. Now, when I said we're a divided church, I think that we've experienced, and this is nothing new, you have, you've heard this before from the treasurer and other people, not just from the minister, but you know that we have declining pledge numbers and declining numbers of members. Even though we've added a few people in the time that I've been here, we're still probably just a little bit less, okay? That is also normal for churches. Doesn't mean we have to accept it because it's normal, doesn't mean that it's good, but that's just the truth of it. But I think the divide that I see in the church, and I, I fully embrace your possible need to challenge what I'm going to say, okay? You may not feel this way at all, but I believe that we have a divide in the church around one group of people that sees the church in an almost irreversible decline and that, you, that Ladera Community Church will cease to exist in a relatively short period of time. And when I say a relatively short period of time, I mean maybe 10 years, maybe 15 years, maybe less, I don't know. And then there's another group of people that not only sees the church in decline, but sees a need for a major correction in the emphasis of what we do as a church. Now, both of these groups share something in common. Both of these groups want to do lasting good. They want to do something good that will last beyond their own lives, the, maybe even the life of the church, but they see very different ways of getting there. So what I think is that before we make some other decisions that we have coming down the road, I think it would be a really good idea to explore for the church council, but also for the church membership, to look at two things that I just mentioned at the beginning, and that is identity and purpose. I think that we have to understand ourselves different. 
when I stepped away from day-to-day -day things here at the church and, and, you know, I wasn't fully removed. I mean, Steli has been working with the office and the children's program and stuff, so I hear things and whatever. It's a little bit different experience to hear those things and to keep my mouth shut <laughs> because she didn't want me to be worried about things or thinking about things while I was gone. But I had this sense that there is an overwhelming desire in our church for us to be the church that we were 20 plus years ago. And we still try to do the same things we did 20 years ago with a lot more people and a lot more resources. And we can't do that. Everywhere that I see us trying to do those things, they sort of break down and begin to fail. Or they don't quite have some kind of oomph that makes it go. And I think that we need to say goodbye to some of the things that we're doing to let them go. I don't know what those things are. I mean, the church can decide what those things are, but I think we need to let go of some of those things. And I think we probably need to grieve about letting those things go. We need to grieve over that old identity that we had that we might have been trying to hang on to a bit too long. And I think we need to think of ourselves as searching for a new identity based on what's here now, not what was here before. And I think that by exploring that identity, a different purpose for the church will emerge. And so you should... If you've read the Bible and you heard the reading today, you should know how I think of us a little bit now. I think of us a, a bit like being a remnant. Now, the remnants in the Bible, most of what the language that we hear about that are the remnants that were sort of talked about and left after or during the Babylonian exile. There was the exile of all the leaders and the elite in Jerusalem to Persia. They considered themselves a remnant. If you read the prophetic voices in Isaiah and some of the other prophets in the Bible, they'll tell you how that group did certain things to hold themselves together as a remnant and feeling a certain purpose while they were exiled and in a foreign location. And all of the people that were left in Jerusalem, there's almost a different set of voices that say, that group is the remnant, and that group was the group that were, they were the laborers, they were the servants, they were the people that didn't have political power, they were the people that didn't have resources. But they considered themselves a remnant too. But both of them had a sense of purpose. Maybe that purpose in the beginning was just survival. Maybe it included more than just surviving, but it may have taken time for that to emerge. And I think we're kind of in the same boat. We have resources, and so we can look at that as the remnant of what we're trying to do things with and accomplish things, or we can look at the people of the church and what we do when we come together as a community and see that as a remnant as well. But the main thing is that it's sacred. That the idea of having a remnant has a certain kind of holiness connected to it. That there's a purpose to it. Now, you can see a remnant is the seed of a new beginning or a people united in purpose. Um, it can be born out of certain kinds of understandings, maybe even a sense of there being something greater than ourselves. 
But I'm going to add two things to that that I think speak to that division that I said existed in the church earlier in my sermon. There are two qualities of a remnant that I think are special if they can be achieved. The first thing is there has to be an acceptance at some point of a group identity that includes a dose of purposeful self-denial. What would that look like in this church? Well, if you have an individual objective or an individual agenda, uh, agenda that kind of has to be let go. Let me say that again. If you have an individual uh, objective or an individual agenda, that probably needs to be let go. There needs to be an authentic care for the existence of the community. That needs to be part of that acceptance and self-denial that says the group and the community that is here has a value that is great, greater than any individual objectives or agendas, greater than anything that we could do in some areas because it has to do with who we are and how we connect. And then that second thing that I think that remnant needs is a connection and a closeness among the members that overcomes rivalries, agendas, and individual or small group membership. In some ways, the membership in the larger group has to be as strong as membership in any of the smaller groups. Those are a little bit unusual to think about. We don't always think about things in that way. It's almost like we take some of those things for granted a little bit. Because we just assume that because we're a church, we have those things. And I think we've been working on that assumption and while people have left through attrition and death and other things, there's these little gaps in our network of people and things that we do that things fall through, that things don't get done or things don't get communicated or connected. One of our biggest problems is communication. And yet we spend more time each week with the update and the announcements and the newsletter and everything that you can imagine trying to communicate. And what I realized while I was on my sabbatical is that when this church was a larger church, you had all these different committees. You had worship committees, you had social committees, you had growth committees, you had different things that were happening. And there were a lot of people that filled all those committees and some of them overlapped. And there was probably an incredible network of conversation that kept people aware of what was happening in the church. And what's really missing from our communication is that. It's not that we don't put the list of all the things we're doing in the update or the list of all the things we're doing in the bulletin or in the newsletter. It's that communicating between that network of people that said, yes, I'll see you later at the Ash Wednesday service, or yes, I'll see you on Sunday when you were meeting and planning worship with other people. Those are the kinds of things that are missing. So there's a, sacred, a sacredness to that kind of communication, a sacredness to that kind of idea of a remnant, that kind of participation that we need. So if we can do that, if we can be that kind of a sacred remnant, I believe it would transform some of the questions that we're trying to work through. 
I believe it would change the way we see things. One of the things I did on my sabbatical is I took this transitional ministry course. The first course I took was the work of the leader. The second one was the work of the congregation. And I can't remember which, which of the two courses this comment was made. But the comment was made that in a church, if you have a 60-40 vote on a major issue, it's really a lose-lose. And then the person said, if you have a 70-30 vote on a major issue in a church, it's probably still a lose-lose. Maybe even at 80-20. And it really made me think about where we stand on some of the issues that we're facing. When a pastor is called to a church, one of the few things that a pastor has the ability to do, if you've gone through the search and call process, and you go to that candidate weekend, and there's a vote of the congregation to hire you, supposedly you've worked everything out ahead of time, the pay, the comp, you know, everything that has to do with compensation. And when you get there that weekend, the pastor only has one out, one way out and save face. And that is the pastor in many cases is allowed to set the percentage that he wants for the congregation to vote. I thought when I went through ministry and training, gee, that's an interesting thing. I wonder what it should be, you know, and I was thinking 70, 80, you know. And the recommendation came back was you need 95%. And I thought, wow, is that ever going to happen? <laughs> the first church I went to, the vote was 96 to 2. And the two people that voted against me left the church. That's how powerful the experience is. When I went there, they wanted me to say 20% because they didn't think they could, they didn't think any candidate, including Jesus, could get 80%. <laughs> when I went to the church in Fremont, it was unanimous. When I came here, I actually didn't even say. And I just accepted the vote for what it was. And nobody ever said what it was. I'm not too worried about it. I felt like it was the right place to be, and everybody seemed to think that it was right for me to be here. But I guess what I'm saying to you is that in matters that really are important, there has to be such a strong consensus about what to do, about how to spend money, about how to care for ourselves. And I think one of the things that I heard with that deep listening on my sabbatical is that yes, that is still true. Those things are important to say that idea that we need a sort of unity that goes beyond any of the little individual issues that we're working on is truly important. I don't know if these ideas feel controversial to you or not. I had this fear in my mind coming back that, oh boy, do they really want to hear this after I've been away? Maybe we should just talk about nice, sweet things. Um, I think that's because my experience in one of the other churches is that I gave a controversial sermon, went away for two weeks, and while I was gone, the rebellion was building. <laughs> so, this, so this way, we, came, we did it in reverse this time, so if there's any kind of sense that this is different or needs to be discussed, at least I'll be around to hear, hear the rumbling. But I think it's important to believe in the future of this church. 
I don't think that we can do things from a perspective that, well, we might not be here in 10 years. I think that would be a mistake. Even though I might not be here in 10 years, I believe this church will be here in 10 years. And I hope that the things that I'm doing are building toward that future. I haven't quite figured out how I want to do the identity part yet with us, maybe starting with counsel and going through some things and talking with them and then maybe bringing some things to the congregation. The same thing with the purpose. Perhaps because we see ourselves as a liberal progressive church, that purpose thing I think it gets kind of pushed to the side a little bit. Most people that come in the door here aren't worried about going to heaven or hell or salvation. In a more conservative church, you're there to be saved. The purpose is pretty much painted on the wall. It's a little bit more complex for us. Now, I happen to believe that salvation is one of those purposes for us. I just believe it's in a different way. I think mostly what we need to be saved from is ourselves, not, not from death or anything like eternal damnation, which I don't believe in anyhow either. So, but it still does make it a little bit more complex to figure out our purpose and what we do. And we know that we want to do good. I'm not speaking against any of the things that we're doing good with. But I think those questions in today's church and in this church are more relevant than they've ever been. I'm optimistic. I have that kind of idealistic look at the world. Steli sometimes says to me, you know, people are people. <laughs> but still... I believe that deep down inside each of us is that part of us that longs for and moves toward things like hope, goodness, well-being, wholeness. So that's the beginning of how we might see our identity. Maybe a little jump start on some of the things that we do. So it's good to be back. It's good to see all of you. It's good to hear the music. And I'm very thankful to be here. And uh, I hope that uh, we have fun going forward. Even though they're big questions, there's nothing that says you can't have joy while you're working on hard things. <laughs>